Dr. Hector, great to have you. Great, man. You get to <laughs> bring up the rear and, uh, and finish this strong. Good. It's good to, then we'll have the panel uh, where everyone can sort of interactively engage with, uh, with all of you. So uh, thank you and thank uh, everybody else for joining us um, on this great evening so far. I want to, since we're moving in on lung cancer specifically, that's going to mm -hmm. be the hot topic area for us. Um, I want to start with screening. Um, it is sure. the, the, the big area that obviously involves um, everyone at every part of the care spectrum. But when we start with that, I have to ask you, who should be screened? It's the b most basic question, but I think there's probably some uh, involved answers to that. <laughs> Very much, but it's also been simplified for us in that CMS uh, has dictated uh, who should be screened. It's actually pretty reasonable. Uh, approach to it, unlike many of the things that the government does, and we're all waiting to see what they're going to do over the next four <laughs> years. This one is actually not bad, and it's what we follow. Um, you know, they, there's nuances and details. There's actually there's a good website, shouldiscreen.com, that, that everybody can go to and look at. But basically, it's patients who are 55 to 77 years old. They should have had a, at least a 30-pack year smoking history. If they've quit smoking, it should have been within the last 15 years. Uh, and most near and dear to my heart, they should be able to undergo thoracic surgery if they're found to have a cancer. Um, that's sort of the hallmarks of it. Um, I, and again, there's nuances to it, uh, but that's sort of the the, uh, the way to think about it best. I think. Well, considering the nuances, uh, the next question is, I mean, if we're following the who, what, when, where, why, how should patients be screened? So that, that's actually undergone a, a real revolution. I think most people probably know that we spent decades trying to figure out whether or not chest X-ray screening was useful uh, and put a lot of time and effort into those. And the answer is no, it's really not. Uh, a chest X-ray is not an appropriate way to screen if you have a patient that you're worried about lung cancer. A chest CT is the correct way. And we've actually, we, we now have, a, as do many other institutions, we have a lung cancer screening program um, where we've set it up that you order the, the screen as a uh, chest CT unenhanced screening. Uh, if you're on EPIC, there's a particular EPIC code to, to order that. If you're not part of the PEN system, then you can just put in a paper order saying, do a screening chest CT, please, and, and they'll figure it out. And what happens with that is actually a, a nurse uh, who runs through the patient's history in the order and confirms that it's a, appropriate for the screening protocols. They undergo their screening on a, a special machine, and they try and use the same machine and the same parameters for all their subsequent scans. Uh, and then there's a very small group of radiologists who are in charge of looking at those so that there's some continuity in it. Uh, and then we've also developed, similar to uh, breast cancer findings on mammography, uh, at Penn we developed a, a sort of warning sign for the ordering of the primary care physicians that gives a classification scheme of how worried you should be you know, a, a one, two, three, four kind of thing to say, this one's trouble, you need to do something about it, or this is nonsense, ignore it, or, you know, this needs a follow-up. And it comes along with pretty specific recommendations about when to get the follow-up. And just to clarify, when you mentioned that chest X-ray, not effective, um, why is that? Is that uh, the sensitivity is too low? Is it, um, what has been found just to uh, lead to that conclusion? Yeah, I, I think it's hard to say why it, it didn't work. Um, in this day and age, uh, you know, I think it said, the CT actually detects the, the much earlier. And so if you're looking at it from a public health perspective, uh, of which I, I'm not an expert in that, uh, it's the idea of how many lives you're going to save for what cost, uh, and therefore finding them earlier. Um, if you find a, a, a nodule that's large enough to show up on an X-ray, uh, it has a much higher chance of having metastasized and being a stage 3 or 4 tumor, and you're less likely to add years of life for that patient. Uh, and so that, that's a little bit teleologic, but that's uh, how it works out that CTs are, are the way to choose now. I see. So why don't we move forward with that and, and consider the patient with um, imaging that uncovers a suspicious finding. Sure. What's the next action step from there? Uh, so again, you know, I think following the, the radiologist's guidance, uh, certainly if you've done it at Penn, if, if it's been done somewhere where, where you don't have that, that sort of easy code, um, then you have to spend a little bit of time sort of untangling the wording that's in there. But by and large, you know, most primary care physicians are not experts in the nuances of what a nodule looks like and aren't going to be looking at the scan themselves. And so you need to, to have the patient seen by somebody who is uh, an expert in that. 
Um, there's no hard and fast rule about who that has to be. Uh, many oncologists don't want to see patients who don't have a cancer diagnosis, and, and frequently the nodules are not. Statistically, nodules are, are much less likely to be cancer than anything else. Um, pulmonologists uh, are probably a, a better choice. The system that we set up uh, at Penn uh, has sort of two facets. One is uh, either through an interventional pulmonary group uh, that has taken on the responsibility of uh, sort of nodule diagnostics. Uh, probably the, the most favored way that is a new program we established, which is really a thoracic oncology intake program, uh, where we took one of our thoracic surgery advanced practice providers who had been seeing patients in, in thoracic surgery for almost 30 years, a, a very experienced individual, um, and uh, she now sees patients uh, as the first person. Uh, so the call comes in, uh, she will see the patient within 24 hours, uh, and then gets whatever appropriate imaging is needed to make a decision and can then say, no, you need to see a radiation oncologist, you need to see a surgeon, you need to go see a medical oncologist, and they'll figure that out. Uh, as part of that program, and it's still in the early stages, I think it's been about five or six months that we've had it up and running, our goal is two weeks uh, from first contact through initiation of treatment. Mm. Uh, and that's been an interesting one because it puts a lot of stress on the system. So that includes getting the brain MRIs and getting the PET scans and anything else you need, uh, and that's been a challenge, and, and we've been able to use that goal to push administration and get more services. Excellent. We're pretty happy with it. That's great. Uh, and your anecdote about the thoracic surgeon actually brings up um, another related question, which is whether, and you might be a little bit biased as a thoracic <laughs> surgeon, but should all patients who receive a diagnosis of lung cancer see a thoracic surgeon? It's a good question. I think the simple answer is no. Uh, the more complicated answer, of course, is it depends. Uh, you know, if you have a, an extreme example where, you know, they, there's clearly liver metastasis, then you know, there's no role for surgery in those patients. Um, if it's an earlier stage or, or sort of suspicious for lymph node metastasis, then, yeah, a, a thoracic surgeon should be involved in that. I think by and large in this day and age, the recommendations are clear that all patients with a lung cancer diagnosis should be cared for as part of a multidisciplinary team. Uh, and that's obviously a catchphrase, but in this circumstance, it, it is important that patients, they don't necessarily need to see all the providers. Uh, and the way we handle it is, unless it's a, a very simple case where you have a, a one centimeter nodule that's clearly a stage one cancer and we don't honestly present that, we just take them out. But most of the patients will be presented and there's usually one or two dedicated thoracic radiologists, there's one or two lung cancer pathologists, there's two interventional pulmonologists in, who show up in our group, uh, there's people who do nothing but needle biopsies, we've got I think six medical oncologists who do nothing but lung cancer medical oncology and then you've got certain, so we have a big group and we argue these things back and forth and uh, I think through that, everybody ends up getting an opinion from each of the specialties, and then we sort of say, okay, this is where we're going. And is this spread across all the, the Penn centers, or is this all headquartered um, at uh, Penn Medicine, the, the hospital in Pennsylvania? So it, it's uh, in the process of being disseminated. Uh, right now, we, we have weekly meetings that, that's in one of the downtown hospitals, and those of us who are at the main Penn campuses all participate. Uh, we just moved, two weeks ago, we moved to a new conference room that has the capability uh, of video broadcasting, and the goal is within the next six to 12 months to be able to include uh, sort of partner institutions uh, and have them present and participate in it. Uh, and that's a little bit of a responsibility that we feel. Right. And continuing along that care continue, um, just going forward with that, um, we have the patient who is diagnosed with lung cancer, going to be referred to you. What kind of tests do you want to have at your disposal um, that get done before the patient even comes into your office? Sure. The most important thing is the actual films from the chest CT. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's surprisingly difficult to get the patient to bring the actual disc with them. But, mm -hmm. but we need to look at the pictures. Uh, and then pulmonary function tests are, are sort of the, the key. Everything else becomes a little bit debatable, whether or not the patient needs a PET scan, whether or not they need brain imaging. Um, it, but in general, some, some uh, quantification or, or assessment is probably a better term of their cardiac risk status. Because obviously what we're trying to figure out is, well, is it a lung cancer and can you tolerate an operation? Uh, and the issues on tolerating an operation, 
can be clarified by exercise capacity. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's amazing, particularly in, in southern New Jersey, how few people can remember walking further than their car. Mm -hmm. So when you see the patients, if you can get them to go take a walk so that they can tell us what it is they're able to do, that, that's hugely important. It turns out that, that there's reasonable data that uh, despite all our fancy pulmonary function testing and other studies, the best assessment test for whether a patient can tolerate lung cancer surgery is uh, pulse oximetry when they climb a flight of stairs. That's amazing. Uh, and so that's typically what we do. We take them out back, and as you can tell, I'm not the one who walks up the stairs, but they get it done. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we turn then to sur surgical outcomes? Sure. Um, it's really, really difficult question to ask because the outcomes are going to be very, uh, very depending on the stage of the cancer, when it's gone. Yeah. Um, but what kind of surgical uh, outcomes, uh, how do patients generally fare after lung cancer surgery? Yeah, no, it's a fair question, in particular because so many patients come with a preconceived notion that, you know, their life is over, they have lung cancer, and, you know, that, that's the end, and it's really not true. Um, we have good data that's, that's over a decade old now from uh, national multi-institutional trials that say the mortality within 30 days for all comers, and that was a study that the youngest patient was 27 and the oldest was 91, uh, and it was everything from a wedge resection through a pneumonectomy, the mortality was 1.38%. And so patients actually do pretty well. You know, the downside is that 40% of them will have uh, at least one complication, but what we run into it is really stuff that, that takes some massaging, but, but rarely has any lasting effects. The most common complications uh, is atrial dysrhythmias. 90% uh, of them are gone within two months. So we mess around with their medications and we torture everybody with checking Coumadin and that kind of stuff. And uh, after a few months, it all goes away and patients really do very well. But in considering the complications or other factors, are there instances, and I'm sure there are, but again, as a thoracic surgeon, um, I leave it to you to, to say no, whether you look at radiation as a better alternative to surgery. No, also a very fair question, and the problem is as radiation therapy has evolved, and you know we now have all kinds of new computer control, and then we've got proton therapy, uh, and we've tried to ask the question, and the problem is that that surgery remains the standard of care, uh, and so if you're going to look to deviate from the standard of care, you run into some equipoise issues with how you can conduct prospective randomized trials. Uh, and uh, in the end, it, it remains a standard of care. But as we look to, to offer surgery to people with more and more compromised lung function, uh, we run up into trouble where oftentimes you cannot accomplish an anatomic resection, uh, meaning you're, you're left with what we call a wedge resection where you literally just take out a, a wedge of lung with the tumor in the middle. Uh, and we're getting increasing evidence that that probably is no better oncologically than radiation therapy. And in, so the, in those patients where we don't think we could do a segmentectomy or a lobectomy or one of our other options, uh, most of the time we will send them ourselves to say, you should go talk to a radiation oncologist and get a sense. Um, at the same time, we struggle to, to get everybody through an operation, so we make them go out and walk, and we tinker with their inhalers and that sort of stuff. Back up the stairs, as it were. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so before we wrap up, I, sure. I want to uh, ask you a similar forward-looking question that I asked of some of our other guests, and that is, what is new in lung care? And it can be specific to Penn, um, but also just in your experience and what you're seeing around you uh, from the thoracic surgery field, what is up and coming in the lung sure. cancer field? I, I think that's really driven by a, a change in the histology of lung cancer. Uh, and it's not clear why this has come about. And I'd say we actually have noticed a, a more dramatic change in, in southern New Jersey than we have in our Pennsylvania patients, uh, in that the majority of cancers that we see now are adenocarcinomas of the lung, and they're often of, of a variant that we call multifocal. Uh, this is the so-called ground glass opacities uh, that you'll, you'll hear them talking about on chest CT scans. It's a whole different biology uh, and behavior, and many of these lesions uh, will sit indolent for five or ten years, uh, whereas the, the other ones, uh, and sometimes we'll have ten or fifteen of them, and nine of them will stay indolent, and one of them will, will progress to an invasive lesion that requires treatment. And it's that, that histology of lung cancer that we've really made the most progress in the, the personalized diagnostic catchphrase in that we've 
learned to look at the genetic mutations, and we have a whole range of new lung cancer therapies. You know, there was just a New England Journal article on PD-1 and uh, the outstanding results from patients who have that mutation. Uh, and that's revolutionized stuff. Mm -hmm. In the surgical side, if you have to operate it and take out one of the lesions that's become invasive, it's awfully nice to be able to take out a bunch of the other ones that are they're in a more indolent form. And the problem is it's very difficult to identify those. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so we're fortunate that one of our partners uh, has developed a, a program of identification where it's basically sort of a, a fluorescent marker that the tumors specifically take up. And we're looking at ways to use minimally invasive techniques to identify those and resect them. And that's been so successful, we've now spread that, that technology. It's, it goes by the acronym of the glowing tumor because everybody likes that. But uh, it's become very useful. We're looking at it in breast and in pancreas and many other uh, areas. Uh, and so those are the new things, I think, driven by the, the lung cancer biology and our oh, ability to deal with those changes. Well, Dr. Peckett, I am pleased to announce that you have brought us home very strongly. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, man. <laughs>